werden. Good afternoon and welcome to Strategies for Moving Towards a Uniform Digital Front Door Experience, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Gozio Health. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're gonna spend our time. Uh, first, we're gonna go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Aaron Meary, SVP, Chief Digital and Information Officer with Baptist Health, Michael Saad, CIO at Munson Healthcare, and Joshua Titus, CEO with Gozio Health. And then we will have our Q&A. Let's jump right in. Aaron, you wanna lead us off and tell us a little bit about your organization and your role. Absolutely, Anthony. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the on the panel today. So a little bit about Baptist Health. Uh, we're located in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, numerous adult hospitals, children's hospitals, uh, long-term care, ambulatory surgery centers, primary care offices, as you imagine, any large IDN. Uh, we do serve Northeast Florida and Southern Georgia. Uh, great partnerships in the area and just a fast, rapidly growing region of the country. Uh, fun stat for you for the day. This is your, your lunch stat. About 100 people a day are moving to Northeast Florida. So just imagine for a second the challenges and trials and tribulations with that much growth and that kind of rapid time period. So lots of fun things to talk about. And uh, uh, digital uh, engagement is front and center for us, obviously, for those reasons. Excellent, Aaron. Thank you. Michael? Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in right now. Anthony, thanks for having me on the uh, podcast and, or the webinar. And uh, it's an honor to always join Joshua and Aaron as well. So thank you. I am Michael Saad. I'm the Chief Information Officer here at Munson Healthcare. Munson's located in the beautiful uh, Traverse City, Michigan area, located in Traverse City, Michigan. It is an eight hospital health system, not for profit. And as Aaron said, also a growing area, not 100 people a day, I don't think, Aaron. I don't think we're quite at that level, but uh, certainly a growing area and growing demographic. I've been with Munson for five months now. Prior to that, was at the University of Tennessee Medical Center where I spent about eight years as the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer. Very good, Michael, thank you. Joshua? Hey guys, Joshua Titus, CEO and founder here at Gezio Health. Uh, man, we love our partners. And uh, Aaron, Michael, thank you for jumping on today and uh, love to hear what you guys uh, have to say and looking forward to the conversation. So thanks for having me on, Anthony. All right, very good. We're gonna jump right into it. Um, Aaron, we're gonna start with you. Health systems uh, want to operate as such as one system. One of the main ways patients feel this or a lack of it is in their front door encounters. Why is it so challenging to provide a consistent experience across the board from hospitals to physician practices, from longstanding parts of a health system to newly acquired entities? It's actually a, a subset of things to discuss there around M&A, which we can get to. Um, and of course, with everything, you got two part challenges. You've got the technology, which a lot of times people say is the easier piece, and then the governance change management factors, which is the hard stuff, getting human beings to do things differently than they have in the past. So Aaron, your thoughts there? Yeah, so it's actually a multifaceted answer, right? So number one, uh, to your point, health systems have usually grown up from acquisitions as well as you know new, net new build, organic build, but a lot of times it's acquisitions. So you're bringing multiple cultures together, multiple people together, to just try to you know determine what the right path forward is, and there's no wrong answer to this. A lot of times, those local tertiary care hospitals, whatever, that have come together, have had their practices for dozens of years, maybe 20, 30, 40 years. They've always been doing it this way. So their way of engaging the community and their practices amongst their ambulatory practices or whatever else may be different, varying site to site. So having to get a good governance structure in place that really encapsulates the entire spectrum of hospitals to operate as one health system, not a collection of hospital systems, hospitals is important. So that's step number one, organization. Are you organized in the right way to make the decisions and facilitate? Then once you've organized, do you have the right personnel and the right roles, right? Are you going to start centralizing your call schedules? Are you going to start centralizing, you know, the way you'd be able to do scheduling and the way you're able to do how you're doing discharge planning? All these conversations have to take place. So two, do you have the right people on the right seat of the bus, mm -hmm. right? Reorganizing where people are to make those decisions. And then third is technology. Realize that it does take technology, but that's all downstream. No tech is going to be the silver bullet. But let me give you a real world example, Anthony. So Baptist Health, 
Uh, we installed our new electronic health record in 2022. Uh, prior to that, we had multiple patient portals. Uh, it was very confusing for our patients. I had to remember multiple logins. Even if you went to one of our ambulatory practices and you came into the hospital, you could opt to find, find the record. You're like, where's the record? We have no record, Aaron, of you going to the ambulatory practice. So it was a very disjointed practice. We went to one EHR across the board, inpatient, out, outpatient, as well as on our revenue cycle side. We had a goal to set up at least 30% of our patients in the first year with a patient portal. Our goal immediately exploded to 60% within six months and continue to accelerate. Now we've got like three fourths of all of our patients are actively using the portal to communicate with us one way or another. And that's just one modality. So it showed us the true nature of how hungry that patients were for that seamless digital experience for us to operate as one entity and to make sure the right people were making the right decisions, checking the messages, responding to inboxes, et cetera, et cetera, in the right modality to activate Baptist Health in a new way. And that's how we've been successful. So they want that experience. You're saying you get the feeling that this is something they're hungering for. They're, they are clamoring for it. And every every market, regardless of your growth market or not, the 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 consumerism of what's happening is critically important to understand, as well as how do these patients want to be engaged with? Some folks want to see you face to face. They want that one to one interaction. No problem. And there's some conditions that's appropriate. But if you look at where the millennial, Gen Z, others, the more newer generations are looking for, they want that episodic on my time, at my place, at my discretion, off the races and go. But they also want to feel your brand electronically. And that's a very unique proposition when hospitals traditionally have excelled in that in-person visit, give you the Ritz-Carlton experience. Now I'm going to give you the Ritz-Carlton experience remotely. And that's a mm -hmm. whole different uh, uh, bag of tricks. Excellent. Very good. Michael, what are your thoughts? I think Aaron did a great job explaining the challenges and the opportunities. Two things I would amplify. Number one, as Aaron mentioned, mergers and acquisitions, and many of us that have been through that know the impact, and that is there's disparate systems. So even from an EHR perspective, Aaron mentioned portals, that's certainly one of them. But the first challenge is making sure you're on a consistent platform and foundation. And I think that can be overlooked a lot of times during an acquisition, people just want things to work, right? That's the answer we get is just make it work. But part of that is laying a solid foundation some of that is just through this, that making sure that everything is on a single platform. And then from there, when that foundation is built, you built off of that. The other piece of this, as we think about just overall uh, digital front door and, and the aspect of this from a patient perspective is, is really, you know, there, there are what well, I've seen health systems that do more best of breed, meaning they like this product for registration. They like this product for, uh, from a patient portal perspective, they've got kind of their own internally developed wrapper they put over a patient portal. The problem is those systems then don't talk to themselves. And so you've got these kind of disparate owners and disparate systems that don't talk to themselves and it creates a, um, a challenge to support, but the patients can also feel that because it's not seamless, it's not integrated. So I think having that seamless and integrated platform where you kind of get rid of these disparate systems and have a system that talks to itself and talks to the other systems. And then from a functionality perspective, it's seamless. So much to go into there, and I will in a minute, but I want to hear from Joshua first. What are your thoughts on what you're hearing? Well, as a hardcore technologist, uh, you probably won't expect me to say this, but I completely agree with Aaron that tech is third. In other words, first and foremost, can we operationalize this on the hospital side? Does it make sense from a culture perspective? And then and only then, once you've got those pieces figured out, figure out what kind of tech lays on top of that and sort of unifies it and pulls it together, right? The, the big challenge being to get everyone under one brand uh, while still remaining and maintaining that local feel, right? And that's where technology comes in. It takes those disparate systems, like Michael was talking about, pulls them together with a feel that feels like it's under one brand. Um, but that really can only be successful once the different pieces that are being enabled there are operationalized on the hospital side. So uh, tech is third, I think is the right way to to think about it, um, but it is key um, if we're looking at the top sort of three things to think about. Um, you know, tech is has a role to play and a pretty important one. One thing that uh, we do that I think is interesting that it helps in this respect is by being location aware. You can have that overall brand, and when I'm at a particular hospital, perhaps some things are made available to me there that are only available locally, and there can be a slightly different look or feel or feature set when I'm at a different hospital, all within the same system. Same look and feel, but different features can come to the forefront based on where I am. So location awareness can help a little bit with that sort of localized feel. 
You know, Josh, it's funny, you know, one of the analogies I use to my team is, you know, when you go on an open table, you're looking for a restaurant to eat at, and you have your wrong location set, and it gives you, you know, for us, it's always, <laughs> th it thinks I'm Atlanta, Georgia all the time, for whatever reason, I get so <laughs> frustrated, like, I don't care about the restaurants in Atlanta, Georgia, I want Jacksonville. <laughs> So it's just as yeah. important in healthcare. Right? The consumers want what's near me, what's convenient to me. How do I get that rapid access to care, you know, in a very endearing way? And so you you hit the nail on the head. Location is the cornerstone for that trust, establishing that you actually know me and you're tailoring to me. And it's amazing how location has really become at the forefront of what our consumers are asking for, what our patients are asking for. Tell me what's close to me. Another fun yeah. fact for your lunchtime, uh, Duval County is the largest county in the United States by square miles wide, which means that the primary county that Jacksonville is in is ginormous. So we have clinics everywhere. People will be driving 20, 30, 40 minutes from point A to point B just because of the, how big this place is. So to the point of it, if I'm 40 minutes away at the beach, I don't want uh, locations downtown Jacks. I want stuff at the beach. So right. it becomes very important overall. So I just wanted to double click what you were saying because it's very important. Yeah, that's that's great stuff in there. Uh, very good stuff. I want to I want to ask you guys um, <clears throat> about this idea of best of breed versus sort of a best of suite, staying in suite. I've heard from different CIOs, very successful CIOs at different health systems. One of which said. We have decided that integration trumps functionality every time. We are staying in suite. It's all about this, what's going to work together and what's integrated. I've heard another CIO say, we give the clinicians what they want. I don't care what it is. We'll work it out on the back end. Two completely different philosophies. Um, mm -hmm. Aaron, I got to hear from you on that. Absolutely. So... The lawyer in me says it depends. No, the reality is um, <laughs> you're going to make sure that you reduce the friction no matter what you do. And so you got to ask yourself the first fundamental question. Is the solutions in front of me, assuming you stay within suite, good enough? It may not be perfect, but is it good enough because it's feature rich enough to answer the clinical need? It's integrated into air quotes one database. So it's very simple to, to use. There's not much API calls or integration calls. Is that possible? If the answer is yes, then work with your clinicians and your caregivers to stay within suite and keep it simple, right? That whole KISS philosophy, keep it simple, stupid, keep it simple. However, that being said and done, IT, CIOs, CDIOs cannot get in the way of a clinician's judgment. So if the solution you have cannot give the telemetry or the measurements or whatever it is that your ologist is asking for, then find the solution that matches so they can provide the best possible care with the least amount of interrupts as possible, AKA, are they staying with a new EHR view and it's behind the scenes? AKA, is it using modern API or fire standards? That way you know the data is rich coming over versus just batch files. Have those discussions. So my philosophy is stay in suite where possible, but do not get in the way of the, of the clinician and make sure you empower them to get to the answer. That partnership and trust takes you the distance. That's great stuff, Michael. Um, <clears throat> your thoughts on that uh, and the, one of the the downsides of refusing to go out of suite because you're 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 totally philosophically tied to integration and interoperability and so I'm staying in suite well if you do that that's fine but you are very tied to your main vendor and mm -hmm. their roadmap and their level of innovation and you perhaps renounced a portion of what you're there for and supposed to be doing so what are your thoughts I think part of the answer is in the question as well, Anthony. I mean, you, I, I think what you want to do is, is avoid the fringes on both ends of that, the extremes, right? So we're only going to focus on interoperability and functionality is not important or the reverse of that. We're only focused on functionality and we don't care about interoperability. The sweet spot really truly is in the middle. I mean, they are both critical and to weigh one over the other, I think is, is difficult to do and, and can be dangerous too, depending on how that's viewed. So I think you've got to look at it through both lenses. I think you have to look at it through the lens of interoperability and explain the value to the clinicians and to others to, to show that why this is so important from a not only a health system perspective, from a patient perspective, and then from a functionality, certainly I mean, part of it is what problem are we trying to solve? And, and I think that's really brings us back to the what problem are we trying to solve? And then does the functionality that solution X, Y, or Z does it provide answers to that problem? And does it solve those problems? So I that's think a, the sweet spot is in the middle there. That's a great point. And, and let's double click <laughs> that for a second, Anthony. I mean, what Michael said is spot on. Your, 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 let's, let's pick on the EHR vendors for a second because they always get picked on, right? Your EHR vendor is not going to be 
a all encompassing CRM, a, a consumer ma a relationship management system. It's not going to be a, a full blown ERP system. It's going to do tenants of those pieces of them, right? But if you need to do true CRM capability campaigns, marketing campaigns, listen, your EHR vendor can do a good job. That's not what they were built for, right? They were built primarily as a billing collection system and then tied on clinical quality measures. So don't expect that billing uh, system to suddenly become a CRM or vice versa. So we also have to know where people belong and not expect unrealistic things from our vendors. And that's where you partner with the ecosystem, exactly to what Michael was saying, to really hit that nail on the head appropriately and responsibly. But don't bank on your existing ecosystem as being the one all catch all. It'll never be there and it will never give you the way you want to go uh, to get things done differently. Great stuff, Joshua. You are a super technologist, you said. So there's lots of good stuff in here for you as a technologist. Are you... What are your thoughts on what you're hearing? I think I said super geeky, but sure, yeah. Uh, so, um, man, I'm just nodding my head here. Uh, um, we have a phrase at, at Gozio that we feel like we do battle against, and that is the omni suite of mediocrity, right? So it's got everything, yes, technically, but only a couple pieces of it are truly good, and the rest are kind of checkbox, right? So uh, I couldn't agree more that a hybrid approach is the right approach. Cherry pick the things that your suite does well and use them. Um, if something better, a best in class solution that's important for your system is available, that's outside the suite, don't be afraid of it. Right. And part of what we try to do is to make that integration painless so that you can pick best in class as determined by you and combine that with whatever suite you've chosen and the features of that suite that, that truly work for you and do a, a good job. And look, these, um, the HRs that we're talking about, there are some things that they do extremely well. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that they are mm, so, so on at best. Um, so to, Put all of your eggs in that one basket and say, you know, it's the old IBM thing. You know, I want to get fired if I buy IBM. Um, we certainly rally against that thought of just, you know, put all your faith in your in your Omni suite and, and hope they eventually ride to the rescue. I don't think that's a recipe for success today. Uh, Joshua, just what Aaron was talking about, about not all applications are created equal in terms of their interoperability. Right. Mm -hmm. He's looking for if he's going to bring in something from the outside, he wants to bring in something that's got good APIs, fire based APIs with rich data sets coming over. So this is all part of the discussion that can go on. Number one, as we said, we're talking to clinicians and finding out is is in suite good enough. And some use the 80 20 rule. Um, but that, you know, they're telling you where it is on that 80-20 in terms of what it's bringing to the table. Yeah. You're there as a technologist looking at maybe perhaps their chosen application and deciding how how integratable this thing is, which may be higher or lower depending on fire and APIs. There are many things swirling around in this discussion. And I think the key here, which which was touched on, is it's all about governance. Right, you need governance so the proper entities weigh in on these decisions in the proper ways, and you come out with the best solution. Joshua, what do you think of that? I don't disagree with what you said. I do think it's important, though, that we think about this this engagement piece. Uh, there's a part for your clinicians and what they need to do their clinical workflows and to make their lives better, and that certainly is something that is absolutely important to to focus on. But then there's also, how does that manifest? How do these systems manifest and appear to the end user, right? And so when we think about patients and visitors and those type of integrations, quite often it's not necessarily integrated into the clinical workflow directly. Um, so you can really think of those two things as separate. As long as they are married in the middle, one is outward facing patient and visitor and one is for the clinicians. And I think those two are best thought of sort of largely separately. I'd love to hear what you guys think of whether you think about them actually separately or do you try to think about them all at once? Like, do you bifurcate the problem uh, as I'm describing it or do you guys look at it some other way? Michael, Aaron, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Aaron, why don't you go I, first? Oh, me? Okay. So so to me, I, I think, I think Josh, it depends, right? I mean, looking at a scenario by scenario, you know, there are times where it can be bifurcated. There's times when it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. There's times where the decision process is even more complicated than that, right? You got a technology then you got the workflow, right? You got people, not in that order, right? We got to chunk it up okay. and look at those dynamics of it and say, what can we do? Not, what can we not do? And also your adoption curve. What I've also found is introducing mm -hmm. technology way too soon and the adoption cycle that your organization can't absorb it or it's the wrong time can be just as, tr just as tragic as, you know, deciding to say all within suite and not, you know, not uh, anticipating external uh, options. So there's also a timing aspect that you as an IT leader have to understand this is the right point to, uh, to adopt things. Now, 
I also, I'm a fan of, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. So sometimes <laughs> in the middle of a hurricane is the best time to introduce a new set of technology because you're, right. you're ready to turn the whole, the whole card table upside down anyways, right? Yeah. So case in point, during our EHR conversion, as an example of the hurricane, basically, I said, hey, at this point now, we can hyper accelerate adoption to help us accelerate adoption of our EHR with these ancillary tech around it to really help us ticketing, you know, location awareness, all these other pieces, which stand alone may have been a lot harder to get adoption for. So to, to answer, you know, succinctly said, Josh, it depends. Uh, but reality is where there's a where there's a will, there's a way. Michael, your thoughts? I think I think digital health is is a journey too. It is not just a one solution. You've implemented it and now quote, you have a digital front door or digital health. I think it's a journey. And, and so an important part of any journey is having a roadmap. And I think it's really important you start to lay out the roadmap and then, you know, to your question, Joshua, whether you look at it piece by piece or holistically, I think the answer is both. You've got to look at the big picture and the roadmap and say, okay, as an organization, what do we need? What does our community need? What do they value? And then from there, it's now breaking those components apart and say, okay, you know, we don't have unlimited funding, right? So how do we figure out from a funding perspective, from a priority perspective, what goes in where and how does that that overall mesh with the roadmap? But but I think you have to have a destination in mind as you move forward with this. That's that's a good point. And and I'll just double click what Michael said, Josh, is that I mean, you know our organization. So I have a fantastic partner in crime with our chief consumer officer, chief marketing officer, and their team is just exceptional. And you cannot do this alone. So I will say the quickest way to fail is if you thinking you as the IT leader, you know best and you do not consult your colleagues in the C-suite, that is a recipe for disaster. So yep. I spend a lot of time mm -hmm. listening to them. They are the experts. They know our community very well. They know what the ethos is, and it's exactly what Michael said. You have to understand the nuances of what your patients are asking for and listen to them because they're telling you. You just may not be listening. They are telling you, and your best advocate for that is your chief marketing officer, that, that department, that team. The Anthony, Excellent. I didn't take us yeah. down a rabbit hole here, but yes, having marketing and IT lock arms on this is the key to success. I've seen it where they do it separately and it's middling at best. Um, but when they both lock arms, that's the ones that are the, the Jacksonville Baptist, the, the Utmuck, uh, Michael, where you were before. Those are the ones that we see our, our strongest successes. Joshua, can you give me a little more detail? Or I think that's a really important point. So when you've seen this done successfully at certain health systems you've worked with, you've seen those entities arm in arm, just a little more detail there. I think there's a, I don't know if it's historic or, or where it comes from, but there tends to be a little bit of a, a wall between sometimes uh, the head of uh, technology CIO, CTO, uh, and the marketing department. Uh, their domains are largely separate to, you know, in years gone by, the website was owned by one and all the infrastructure was owned by the other. And now we have this idea of digital engagement, um, digital en en engagement on mobile, for instance, and <clears throat> it sort of overlaps and, and you know, Five years ago, mostly it was marketing folks that would call on us and help us engage people on mobile. And today it's almost exclusively CIOs and CTS, so it shifted. Um, but each one has something to bring to the party, right? The CIO, the CTO, understanding the, the underlying technology and the marketing team knows how to engage their catchment area better than anyone else, right? And it's really that combination of strengths that, um, that need to be had in order to successfully launch. And, and success here largely is measured by engagement. Am I actually engaging hundreds of thousands of people or not? Um, and it's it's that you know chocolate and peanut butter are better together. And we see that with uh, IT and marketing. If they work together, um, they're incredibly successful. If they don't, they struggle. Excellent. All right, let's talk about functionality. We talked a lot about uh, interoperability and integration and consistent experience, but let's focus on just the functionality for a minute, independent of consistency. When it comes to the digital front door, what and I, you know, are we doing surveys? Are we doing studies? We're talking with our marketing people, uh, patient experience people. We have to figure out if we want to put certain functionality out there that we're putting out the right functionality, what they actually want, as opposed to what we think they want that perhaps they don't want. Um, and Michael, I'd like to start with you. Functionality. What are your thoughts there? What do they want? Yeah, I think it all comes down to value, the value for the patient, value for the health system, right? So uh, look at all of us. We have apps on our phones. The ones we use are the ones we find valuable, whether it's for entertainment or uh, healthcare purposes or education, whatever. But that's the apps we use are the ones that we find valuable and we are drawn to those because it offers us some type of value. It's the same thing from a health system. Again, I, I think it's the caution here is you don't want to just check the box and say, okay, we have an app or we have quote a digital front door and, and now we're good. 
if the patients are not using it, there's no value in it. So to your, you know, part of the question, Anthony, is who do you partner with, right? Whether that's chief experience officer, chief marketing officer, I've seen even HCAP scores. I mean, we can see, you know, some results from HCAP scores that help inform what some of the needs are. And, and every health system is different. So what may, the, maybe the need in Aaron's community may be different than in Northern Michigan. Uh, I can tell you the previous organization I was with, one of the biggest needs was wayfinding. And that may not be the the, the natural start to a digital front door or, um, uh, you know, kind of a digital health strategy, but it worked. And that was really the the fulcrum in which was used to then move the system forward and to start using that as the foundation for all things digital health. So I, I think, again, the value to the community is what really what you're after here. And every community is different. So it's going out there and understanding talking with the community directly and understanding where is the value. I think the second piece of this though, too, is it, it needs to be multifaceted in functionality. Meaning if you just had it used for patient portal, uh, I don't know there's enough value there for the for the patients to use that. It has to be multifaceted in too. So things like patient portal, um, you know, telehealth visits, kind of expanding. Again, you wanna draw the patients to that. My vision, I, I think a shared vision for digital health is that should truly be a front door, meaning that's where you want the traffic to come in and out of. I think a lot of us have front doors, we have open windows, back doors, and there's you know kind of consumers and in communities integrating and interfacing with health systems in a multitude of ways. And if we're truly talking about a digital front door, it needs to be welcoming, add value, and something that the community sees as something they want to use. Very good, Aaron. Thoughts? You know, interestingly, you know, I moved to Jacksonville in 2021 from Austin, Texas, right? Austin, Texas, again, being more of a, call it younger city, you know, anchored by the University of Texas in Austin, my alma mater, um, you know, wonderful town, but the average age there, I think our average age of our patients was like 38 years of age, right, in the hospitals. Uh, I moved to Jacksonville, and immediately my thought, I said, okay, it'll be an older demographic, uh, a few years older than obviously 38, right? Actually, our demographic's mid-40s. Um, but their wants and needs are going to be totally different, right? They're not going to be digitally nativists. They're not going to be digitally savvy. That was my wrong assumption. So one of the first community meetings I went to with our patients, I'm in this room, uh, I would say the average age, I was probably the youngest person there, about like half. Uh, so these are, these are elderly folks. And the question was asked, you know, how do you want us, how do you want Baptist Health to engage with you? I kid you not, here are these seniors, they all hold up their cell phone and said, I want you to know me on this. Why don't you know me better on this? I was taken aback. Believe it or not, the more research I do, the, the senior population is more digitally savvy than the younger generation. The younger oh. gener generation is just impatient. The <laughs> senior uh, generation wants to be engaged with, they want that interaction, they want that trust on a digital modality. And I think COVID-19 simply highlighted that even more so. So what are we doing? We're doubling down on our Back to Baptist Access app. Right? We're seeing tens of thousands of downloads and impressions and re-downloads and that stickiness factor on people's devices because they want to be engaged with that. With that app, you do have wayfinding. You do have access to your patient portal. You do have things like you know pay your bill and all the other stuff that people want to do. Or believe it or not, you know one of our newest hospitals, Baptist Clay, the cafeteria food apparently is so good it's lauded for that people go there versus going out to a restaurant. They want to go eat at the hospital cafeteria. Okay, great. So if you want to get to my cafeteria and have a burger, which apparently is the best in Clay County, hint, hint, I haven't tried it, but I'm going to try it soon. Um, that's how you get there. That's what people want it. So, but that took understanding people. That took having those conversations saying, how do you want to get to know me? And that took an understanding and a willingness in this organization to say, let's go do it. Also, fun fact, when I was interviewing here in the summer of 21, actually spring of 21, and deciding, am I going to come here and leave Austin, Texas? The first billboard I saw when I left the airport off getting onto I-95 coming south was a giant uh, billboard that said, download the Baptist Access app. So even before we were on one integrated EHR platform, we knew this is what the community expects of us, and that's the way to go about it. So exactly to what Michael said, it's that listen first, respect, and then engage folks where they want to be engaged. Excellent. Joshua, what are your thoughts? I love hearing uh, the passion behind what these guys are talking about. It really warms my heart to hear. And um, I guess what I would add to it is something that we've learned over the decade or so I've been doing this. And that is um, if you want to engage people um, on mobile, um, there's no killer feature, right? There's no one thing that just this alone will cause people to engage in mass with my offering, right? But instead, it's a, it's a combination of things. And those things share kind of common categories, whether it's access to care, meaning 
availability and scheduling? Can I grab some time on my doctor's calendar? Can I save my spot at the urgent care? Right. Or is it more, you know, more current things like an AI chatbot or price transparency or symptoms checkers, which we're hearing a lot about now? Um, it's a combination of those things. And what we see when we look at usage numbers is a tipping point that happens where, um, you know, two or three features, you're getting a couple hundred users a day, maybe. And then you add that fourth and fifth, and suddenly you're going into thousands a day, 10,000 a day. Um, so really, it is you have to reach a certain level of utility to the end user. Uh, to warrant um, a spot on their precious problem-solving companion, right? Their mobile device that we all carry around with us. So it is, uh, I think uh, Michael said it earlier, it's that um, does it provide me some, some utility and, and what is the overall experience that I'm looking for? Um, one interesting thing I'd also share uh, that's, I guess, one of the bright spots around coming from behind as we are in healthcare is that uh, people have already been trained to what to expect. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Open Table before. Um, Google Maps, Apple Maps, like we, we basically have an idea of what kind of convenience we want. Um, and so really our job becomes um, basically putting the answers where they're asking the questions and, and giving them what they expect. And what they expect is the same thing they have everywhere else. So it's a little bit easier in that respect. Um, but bring together those key features um, and put it in a, in a, in a uniform package um, and you see the engagement happen. Um, and that's what we've learned. Uh, no killer feature, but need a combination and off you go. All right, very good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, so one of the, Michael, let's start with you. One of the the big features that we think people want in an app is scheduling, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be able to find the physician you're looking for and then book time. Yep. And I'm guessing that, this is my guess, that you, know, you can install an app that does that, but actually getting the physicians on board with having a communicated, clear, schedule that is up to date i'm guessing that physicians like their independence and freedom of movement they want to be able to take off when they want to take it they want to they want to fly around with a lot of freedom to do their rounds and they want a lot of freedom and you know having to submit a schedule that is then input online and people are booking, and they probably like a lot of change Tell me, am I wrong or is this one of the biggest challenges in delivering what we think is one of the most high demand things by the consumer? No, you're, you're spot on, Anthony. I mean, you know, Aaron started us off by talking about people, process and technology. And the easiest of those three was technology. And, and that's exactly what you're driving at here. You know, technology has solved this problem years ago as it relates to scheduling. I mean, we've had this functionality available years ago. The challenge is working with the providers that, uh, explaining to them and working with them and letting them know that there is value to the patients and opening up your schedule. But like you said, there are organizations where that their positions resist that. Some organizations mandate that, others make that optional. Um, so I, I think that's a cultural question and a really a cultural answer and how the health systems want to interact with patients and, and their providers. But certainly, I mean, the technology has been there for years, you know, to Aaron's point and what Joshua said, uh, it, this is not a technology problem or question even it's it's a process question a cultural question and something that's more of a leadership decision and discussion so for, as the cio what the cio role in this is you know hey i helped to do it. you say you guys said you wanted this functionality you want to be able to do this so we put it in like as the cio i can't get the physicians to put in their schedule it's a little outside my wheelhouse but we don't want to be so passive, right? We want to be leaders at the table, which means we don't just get to put in the technology and walk away and say, I'm done. So what do you do to further that? Well, that's that's where it's important to collaborate with our peers and to let our peers know that this functionality exists. Our patients are asking for it. Let's assume they are, and, I, and we know that they are. Our patients are asking for this. Then it's to collaborate with our other C-suite peers and to say, is this something as a system we think is important enough that we want to address this concern and and change the the behavior or the culture of this. But you're right. I mean, the CIO is not the decision maker in this, but certainly he or she is the individual that can help drive some of these conversations and talk about how the technology is available and that this is a decision that needs to be made from a collaborative stance. And Aaron, does it ultimately come down to a meeting in which you say, listen, I've given you guys what you wanted. It's sitting there. The patients want it. We got to get this done on your end, you know? 
Well, well, just tell me about that, Aaron. How does that work? Yeah, no, it's so, so, so the right thought, Anthony, but the way you go about it is a lot more diplomatic than that, right? So I'm a big fan of showing the cards, showing all the data. And so for us to get uh, fast pass and open scheduling adopted across Baptist Health, at first was reluctance because people didn't understand it. They didn't understand what that meant. And it was a misunderstanding that, oh, my calendar is no longer going to be my mind to deal with somebody else. And it was exactly those concerns. Well, that's not the case at all. What we're doing is finding synergies of appointment types and patient visit types. Not everything is good for open scheduling. Not everything is good for fast pass. And sort of highlighting the wins. I'm going to give you a specific win. Our, we have one of the best cardiology departments in all of Northern Florida. Three-star STS ranked, fantastic surgeons. I mean, they are booked out solid. And they are great docs. If you have a heart problem, these are some of the best docs to go to in the region. However, you couldn't get a visit, right? You were stuck. You were waiting like two, three months for an encounter. And it was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Well, we realized looking at the schedules, how many people were scheduled and then suddenly pull out and not show. So you had a high no-show rate or I'm scheduling, I scheduled today, but I really can't come in because little Johnny's sick. I'm going to schedule next week. So you had these missed appointments, right? That was right for fast pass, meaning that suddenly the appointment came up. I'm in the schedule for tomorrow. I'm going to get a call saying, hey, Aaron, can you come in today? We we're able to move those appointments up and get more patients in. As of year to date, they're at 132% of expected visits, meaning they're 32% over year to date, right? Because of the technology and the processes and conversations we're having, they have happier patients. The physicians are like, hey, I no longer have these patients. I was expecting to see Aaron. He bailed on me, but now Aaron's showing up. So I'm having better outcomes. It's a win, 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 win. We now take that. We go to our rehab department. Our rehab has the same issue. They adopt it. Now they're up above what their expected was. And so department by department, we're showing the cards. We're showing the data. We're showing the wins. We're letting physicians evangelize. Hey, this really worked for me. It didn't mess up my schedule. I'm still able to get off at 3 o'clock and go deal with whatever because I came in at 5 in the morning. All these pieces, but we're doing it with data. We're doing it hand in hand. It takes a minute, though. It takes some time. But I'm a big believer in put your cards on the table have a data-driven metric discussion, be honest and transparent, and then where you standardize, you standardize with eyes wide open and have a conversation about it. If I were to go into a room full of surgeons or physicians and say, thou shall, they would throw me out before I could finish my sentence. And they should, <laughs> and they should. But it is my job to empower them with knowledge and let them get there organically because I have yet to meet one physician in 20 years who does not want to wow and please their patients. I have not met one. And they all want to do the right thing, but they also want to have a sense of a life, which I can appreciate too. Yeah, great, great stuff. Um, Joshua, you work with a lot of customers. I think this is a really, really tricky thing that people are trying to deal with. What have you seen in the systems that are successful in terms of how the CIO types are getting or encouraging or cajoling or furthering the engagement of physicians around scheduling to play ball? That's opaque to me, quite honestly. Um, it's it's Aaron working his magic behind the scenes, but that rarely bubbles up oh. to us. What we do have every now and then, uh, and this was more when we had independent physician groups, uh, there may be one group that was a holdout and really didn't want to participate. And I guarantee you, that is the exact group that one week after go live is absolutely banging down the door to want to know why they are chopped liver and they're not part of this mobile app and they get added. Um, but again, that that that, that was happening um, six, seven years ago. We really haven't seen uh, a physician group uh, today that has resisted um, basically having um, access and scheduling um, on mobile. But that could be um, due to the efforts of, you know, Michael and Aaron behind the scenes of getting them on board. But it certainly hasn't bubbled up to, to us. When we show up, they want to be on board. Awesome. All right. We have... Uh... Question from the audience from our good our good friends Tressa Springman. Um, I hope she didn't want to say anonymous, but anyway, you can see your name up there. So <laughs> Tressa, it didn't work out for you. Um, Michael, let's start with you first. Uh, Tressa writes, "You are both well on your way on this journey. What are the next three key functions or features on your to do list, and um, where, what? And basically, how did you choose those uh, next three functions?" So, Michael. Yeah, I think we talked about the importance of having a roadmap. Certainly that is, uh, we need to look at every organization's in a different place in their journey. So I'm sure Aaron's answer would be different than the answer of my current organization versus the answer where I came from. Uh, I, I can tell you from a, a months in healthcare perspective, you know, we're, we're still working through some mergers and acquisitions. So we're still working on getting on that common platform from an EHR perspective and the portal piece. 
So um, that is certainly next up on the list. It's getting that that consumer portal the same. It's then integrating all these tools. So the the history here has been a lot of best of breed and purchasing different tools that have been necessary to implement uh, for good reasons at the time they were purchased. But when you step back and look at it holistically, these tools do not necessarily integrate and work together. So it's really getting that integration together then um, and helping to mature. And then the last piece of this is the reporting, right? Because I think it's so important. A lot of times we just implement tools and then we're on to the next project. And there's no kind of accountability. There's no looking at usability, use case, and saying, is this really providing kind of the value we talked about? And I think having to go back and, and looking at metrics and looking at uh, talking to the, the community, like Aaron mentioned, and you know, going out there and saying, is this what you wanted? Is this what you needed? And how can we make things better? So I think then going back and making sure that we're still providing that value we talked about is also important. Excellent, Aaron. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Number one, uh, we're really focused on uh, chatbot automation. We have a number of chatbots that are out there. So learning new skills and adoption of new skills, uh, everything from price transparency to answering simple questions of, of direction, getting things out there to information. What our patients are telling us is that they don't want to be waiting on hold for simple directions or simple instructions. So we're trying to teach new skills to our AI chatbots as fast as possible to engage our, our members, uh, no matter where they may be, whatever digital property they're on. So that's number one. Right, upscaling our existing uh, AI chatbots so that they can answer 80% of the questions that come in from the general public. Uh, two, social media, right? Our We have a great social media team um, really embedding that social media information into our campaigns to get sort of that digital sentiment real time across the, across the environment is important. Also so that we focus on the messaging the right folks in the right places. Not every part of Jacksonville has a high uh, predisposition of uh, expected mothers, for instance, right? Not every part of Jacksonville has a high predisposition of folks with diabetes or that need oncology cancer care. So trying to tailor our campaign so that it's, it's matching the people that are in that region and it really is effective and efficient. And again, this is a partnership with our marketing team who does a great job of that. And then embedding that data into our CRM so that that's part of the total golden record of, of patient Aaron. The third thing we're working on, I'm going to give you a third one, Tressa, but it sort of dovetails something else, is identity management. It's amazing how wrong we get. Can we truly identify Aaron from a community perspective? Once you present in my hospital, sure, I got you. But in the in the ether, how do I actually know you? How do I have resolution to who you are? We spend a lot of time of that out of stream, out of band identity so that we know Aaron before he walks in. And I also know Aaron when he presents for the first time, you know, what are your typical issues, you know, in your age? Have you gotten your... Uh, your annual colonoscopy, right? All these things that you're supposed to be doing from a wellness and overall perspective, that getting to know you some aspect of somebody is becoming critical. Married together with, this is the second half of that answer, the provider side, right? We have to match the provider community affiliate uh, identity as well so that we have a total ecosphere of understanding who we're dealing with and our digital properties can engage with you in the right way. Ultimately, our vision is however you engage with Baptist, you're going to get digital properties surfaced to you that matter to you, right? If I have young kids at home, like I do now, you're going to get a lot of access to our Wilson Children's Hospital if you so need it. If I'm elderly, you're going to be part of our age well uh, visits, right? So we see what's going on there from an elderly care, rehab, those sorts of things. That's how people want to be known. As I keep going back to what I said when I first moved here, get to know folks on their device and get to know who they really are. And that's where we're going about it. Excellent. Uh, very good. Joshua, question for you. When you have folks coming uh to Gozio and they're interested in working with you, um, what's what's driving them? What's the main thing? Like they say, they come to you and they say, here's, here's what I have going on. Here's the problem I need to solve that I've been charged to go and solve by the business. So I'm out here talking to vendors because I got this need. So wh right. what generally does that sound like? Um, I think it's a it's a need with, with sort of two faces. One is the inward facing one, which is I have all these disparate data systems that I have and I need them to sort of be unified uh, so that someone would actually be able to engage with them, right? That, so that they are interoperable to the to a certain degree uh, as much as necessary. But how do I, how do I pull all these things together? My availability and scheduling and wait times and and my physician database. How do I pull those together? And then the second piece is uh, a realization is the, of a lot of our clients, um, which is. And then get a bunch of people to engage with this. How do I get people to engage on mobile? It's not in our hospital's DNA. Like we don't inherently know how to design a, a mobile offering that people will want to engage with. 
And so those are the two sides of the of the coin they're struggling with. Um, and that's what we attempt to answer as efficiently as we can uh, and give examples of how others have done it, which I think is really uh, instructive. Michael mentioned that, that, you know, everyone's at a different spot on their journey. And that's absolutely true. But I think if you zoom out a little bit and look at the journeys overall, they tend to have a lot of commonality between systems, systems that are very different, but there's a similar sort of path that you go down um, in terms of what the digital journey looks like. Um, so hopefully that answered the question on the two things yeah. that we're pulling together um, in terms of solving for them. But of course, I love to hear uh, what Aaron and Michael think we solved for them. Um, but that's how we did. Michael, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you've done with Gozia? Yeah. Again, uh, previous employer spent a lot of time working with Joshua and his team. Uh, as we talked about, the the really the foray into digital front door and digital health was wayfinding. So there was a two or two and a half million square foot campus that was just overwhelming for our patients to navigate. We heard a lot of feedback from our community that was very difficult to um, to navigate the campus. There was a lot of people who had trepidation and concern about even going on campus because it was so difficult to navigate. So we reached out to an, a number of vendors that a full RFP process and, and Gozio came out ahead in that process. And um, from there, really, that, that was the start of a great relationship where um, wayfinding was the first one. Then COVID hit and when it, it, it quickly exploded into, uh, you know, results for COVID testing and patient portal and telehealth visits and kind of all those things that we all uh, jumped towards during COVID and really expanded pretty massively beyond that. So it has now become that single point of contact from the community to the, the health system as a result of uh, the work that Joshua and his team have done. Very good. Aaron, you want to just give a quick highlight? Yeah, so again, started with wayfinding, right? We were opening up a $200 million plus uh, critical care tower for our Wolfson Children's Hospital, the Barori Tower, state of the art. Um, and I was saying to you earlier, you know, we're one of the largest square mile wide, uh, you know, counties in the country. And so parents that were anxious, I mean, obviously, if you're taking your child into the NICU or the PICU, there's a lot of anxiety there, right? Navigating this behemoth downtown Jacksonville and then getting over to the tower, people were intimidated. So how can we do wayfinding to get you from directly from your house right to that doctor's office or wherever you're going, that unit? Um, so we started there, right? We started wayfinding for the Barori Tower and expanded that across to all of our hospitals, including mapping internally of the hospitals and the wayfinding and locations. So that turn by turn, you know where you're going. And that all came from those listening sessions, right? Those listening sessions pr told us that folks are tired of getting lost. And it was a true statement. You know, any urban facility has those challenges. I mean, I've been in some hospitals where they literally have to paint on the ground a different color of stripes, right? Follow the red stripe to the ED, follow the yellow stripe to the L&D, right? I mean, people are trying everything they can do to figure out how to navigate. But for us, digital was where people were because they all have smartphones. And so it's been a tremendous win. And so it's been a great partnership in expanding uh, those use cases bit by bit, um, you know, as, as new things come up. And uh, it's a critical component of what the digital experience is all about. Aaron, let me, let me ask you, this has been sort of uh, one of the things that, that I've been looking into for 20 years. Uh, and it's evolved with the CIO role, the, the lead versus follow element of the CIO role. Um, it used to be, you can't be out there in front leading a project. It's got to be you know, desired by the users. If you lead it, if you stick technology down their throat, they're going to reject it. Um, so it was initially a hang back. And then it was, the messaging was, you need a seat at the table. You want to be a leader, right? So those are kind of two different uh, mm -hmm. ways, two different ends of the spectrum. When it comes to this type of work around the digital front door, are you passive and simply responding to what bubbles up from the governance process that's requested by the business? Or do you lead and say, oh, hey, by the way, I know this isn't high on governance, but kind of you really need to be doing this and everybody's doing it. And there's some really cool technology out there. So how, do, how, does, how does this get navigated by the CIO? Yeah. So first of all, you know who I am, Anthony, and I'm a very much yes. a, uh, extra, extroverted, but let's put that aside by personality, right? Which can be <laughs> way out there. Like, let's take, take this cool <laughs> stuff out. Um, it's It's got to be tempered in the right way. I mentioned earlier organizational appetites. So you got to know your organization. And then two, you have to approach it from a perspective of informing and teaching and handholding. And not everybody is going to get up to speed as fast as you are. So let me give you a specific example. We were one of the first health systems to set up a private uh, GPT 3.5 chat GPT farm before Microsoft created Copilot. 
We built our own version of Copilot. It was profiled on modern healthcare. I partnered with my buddies at a Cleveland clinic. Our teams and their teams collaborated to build these GPT so we could learn about large language models, right? Now, I did that because I knew AI at some point was going to come on the scene here at Baptist. I wanted to teach the organization eyes wide open with our own data in a private instance so that there was no HIPAA concerns, whatever else. And we learned for a year before suddenly Microsoft did this huge announcement with Copilot and all these things like that. Great. But because we're able to do that, we're now able to take an organizational stance of we're good with AI as long as it's responsible, it's, it's monitored, it's measured. We talk about it. We run it through IRB if necessary. But if I had not done the legwork a year before that, to educate folks on the, the guardrails, the bumpers, I don't think we'd be in this position because people were like, whoa, 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 there's a lot of unknown regulatory. It was just a true statement. But because we did that, we got there, right? My, mm -hmm. my aim was always be a lead adopter for AI, but I couldn't just go there off the bat because I knew there would be concerns if we didn't have our eyes wide open. So much like digital, your job is to inform and teach and make things not scary. And as I've said many times, do not be creepy with the technology, right? <laughs> Decreepy it by being transparent. That is the best thing you can do. That's quotable. Good Lord, decreepy <laughs> it. I love it. Michael, do you decreepy things? Uh, I've never used that term before. I'm going to write that down here too, Aaron. Decreepy, that's a good one to have. I think some of this is just the the natural evolution of what the CIO role has has underwent or undergone in the last you know decade or so too. Anthony, you talked about organizations that, um, you know, wanted to really make sure that this was, quote, not an IT project and IT was behind the scenes. And, you know, CIOs traditionally at that point were, um, you know, as the saying goes, wires and pliers, right? They were focused on infrastructure and and um, they were kind of the lead technologists, if you will. But now that's really changed. I think CIOs have a seat at the table. They're viewed as a trusted advisor and an executive within health systems, and they oversee the technology platforms. And so I think because that role has changed so much, I think that the digital health question that you asked about, you know, whether what is the role for CIOs in this? I think, again, it's that collaborative setting the strategy and understanding where is technology going. And then to Aaron's point, whether it's chat GPT or any other new functionality, it's helping to educate and inform. And then from there, you make a, a collaborative decision with our peers and say, does that match our strategy as an organization? Or is that not, not something we think has strategic value? But I think it's that education, that information, and helping to lead some of the strategic discussions. So I feel validated because it is complicated. It is nuanced and it is art, right? That's what I'm hearing. It's not one or the other. There's a lot of art and science in there. Um, and so that's really what we're talking about as the higher level CIO skill currently. It's not as simple as sit behind and do what they tell you. It's not, you know, make, lead the charge. It's in the middle. So it, it's really interesting, and it, it sounds like you, uh, a lot of art there. Joshua, um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask you a question, then give everyone a, a quick lightning round of final thoughts. But the CIOs that are coming to you, that you have the conversations with, do you get a sense where they are in terms of where their organization is? Are they leading the organization? Are they responding to what's requested by the organization? When they come to you, what are they saying has brought them there in terms of their mandate? Um, are you hearing anything consistent? Is it all over the place? It certainly used to be all over the place, but it's much more consistent now. And that is typically there is a, a group that's put together uh, that has been charged with engaging the catchment area on digital and on mobile specifically. Uh, and the CIO is leading that group. But that is what we see more and more. It's not the lone, the lone ranger that used to ride in and, and talk to us. It, it's more, we already have a group put together. It has people from patient experience, it has people from marketing. It has, right, there's a whole uh, group put together. The CIO is often leading that group, um, likely due to budgeting, and then he's going to know, he or she's going to end up paying for it at the end of the day. Um, but that is what we're seeing um, predominantly today. It's going to be a group of people who show up. Excellent. All right. Let's go with uh, the lightning round, as I mentioned. Final thoughts, best piece of advice. Let's not take the cutting edge, bleeding person that's, you know, all over this. And let's not take someone who's never heard of patient engagement. Let's go middle of the road, 300 bed, hospital based health system, kind of finding their way, maybe taking some, some little steps. Uh, best piece of advice, Michael, for them. I think it comes back again to value. What, what, what is it the core problem you're trying to solve? What is it that your community needs that you are not providing today? 
and where does that fit in your roadmap and your strategic priorities as an organization? So I, I think clearly 300 bed hospital, you've got to understand your organization, you've got to understand your community and focus on bringing value to your community and your organization. I would also say avoid the shiny object syndrome because that is so much a part of this too, where, where you know we get feedback from all types of people, well, you should make it like this or it should look like that. Um, the problem is it, it's taking all of that and you have to marry that to again, the, the value and what is the problem you're trying to solve. So it's, it's focusing in on making sure that you understand the value of this and um, delivering on what you can to provide benefit to the community. Excellent. Aaron, your final thought. Yeah, I would say did it what Michael said and add a few things to it. So if you're at a 300 bed hospital system, which I have been a CIO of a 300 bed hospital system, so I understand how limited your budgets I are. I remember. By the way, yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I've <laughs> been around for a minute. Um, start small. Right. Do things, simple things. Right. Are your are your existing digital properties multilanguage, multilingual? Right. Do you comply for ADA compliance in a really great way? You know, are you robust in the way you are offering your web technologies so that it's viewable on a mobile device? I'm not talking about high, hard lift, expensive lift. I'm talking about simple, low hanging fruit. Right. Bring your digital skills to help there, which builds trust which then builds trust to begin to talk about the investments for the future, what you can budget for in, in future fiscal years to buy a, a good shiny toy that actually solves a problem and provides value, exactly what Michael was saying. But don't go off the off, off the shelf and say, I'm going to buy this and this and this and this. It's not Toys R Us on a, on a spending spree, right? This is about reality of work. And you have to put the work in and build the trust. But at a low, small hospital like that, you can build trust by doing simple things and building those partnerships with your C-suite colleagues so they trust you and your knowledge. You're there for a reason. They picked you for a reason. Go be that reason, but be appropriate in that reason. And the best piece of advice I was always given in my career, don't fight the river. Meaning, if you're navigating the current, don't go upstream against the river. Find the current, let the current take you, and you'll still get to the same place. And a lot less, uh, you'll be a lot less wet at the end of the day if you don't fight the river. <laughs> Love it. Absolutely fantastic. Joshua, final thought. Uh, my final thought would be, you know, I guess from a vendor's perspective, um, PowerPoint's really easy uh, and doing things in the real world and technical things is difficult. And so my, we find ourselves quite frequently replacing a failed attempt. And uh, so my advice uh, to CIOs out there and folks who may be watching this is, you know, be Missouri, show me. So if someone says they can do something great, Go see if it actually works for yourself. Talk to your peers. Talk to people who have attempted it or, or, or partnered with these folks and see whether or not it actually works in real life. Um, and I think you'll be surprised. Um, so be Missouri. That's my advice. Well, we got we got a lot of good stuff in here. We got be Missouri. We got to go with the current. Uh, it's not Toys R Us on a spending spree. <laughs> and my favorite, decreepify it. So <laughs> really awesome stuff today, guys. Um Regarding continuing education, you could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready for viewing. If you want to work with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel and good friends, Aaron Miri, Michael Saad, Joshua Titus. I want to thank Gozio Health for sponsoring and making the event possible and you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good to be here.